Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the pre-conference for Trigi EdCat 4.0. Um, I'm Raquel, I'm one of the organizers, uh, as is Katya, who's at the back uh, recording this. So um, we just want to welcome you all here. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we want to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 4 land, and um, Ryan's going to help us unpack that and what that means, because we don't want to do those acknowledgements if we're just saying it and it's just words. So he's going to help us um, unpack what that means and what, uh, and that's kind of why we are here tonight and tomorrow, to so learn a little bit more about that. Um, so I have been a huge fan of Ryan's work for probably about um, three years, I think. I, I uh, kind of heard about his work and started listening to some of his podcasts. So he does a podcast called Red Man Laughing. Um, if you are teachers in here, that is kind of like your, for your own learning, uh, probably not the one you want to use with your students. <laughs> you can use, like, I use snippets of it, but you just, you just have to really screen it for F-bombs. It, it could be renamed Red Man Swearing. Um. <laughs> yes, but it's really good for your own learning. Um, I have really grown a lot, I think, since I started listening to that podcast. Stories from the Land is always a really good one to use for teaching. Um, it is Indigenous people sharing their stories. Um, it's There's young people on there that kids can really connect with, and so that one I found really powerful. Um, so he does amazing work. He's, he does lots on the go all the time. Um, podcasts, um, a movie called Colonization Road that he was just touring before he came here. Um, so lots of amazing work that he's doing and we are really lucky to have him here uh, to share that with us tonight. So just help me welcome Ryan McMahon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, the organizers and the university and uh, everyone that made uh, this event possible. Uh, the recognition of territory has been done, uh, so I won't repeat it just because it makes me feel good. Uh, and I say that because I think the territorial recognition can be problematic if we only go as far as recognizing the territory. So instead of repeating Raquel's acknowledgement of territory, I'll situate myself inside of that acknowledgement. Um, and I'm, I'm Anishinaabe from uh, Treaty 3 territory in Northwestern Ontario. My community is uh, Kuchiching First Nation, and uh, it's on the shores of, uh, of, of Rainy Lake, uh, on the, the place that we call Neweashing, which is uh, historically what uh, is uh, called uh, the Dawson Route, uh, a fundamental canoe and paddling route that uh, helped settle uh, Canada. Uh, in my territory, in, in Treaty 3 in Northwestern Ontario, um, we uh, signed Treaty, uh, obviously just before Treaty 4, and um, Treaty 3 is a, is a really uh, essential treaty to what becomes the numbered treaty process in Canada. And uh, this evening what I would like to do is uh, uh, problematize uh, uh, the fact that we're all treaty people. We're all treaty people. Uh, I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about Canada 150 and subsequently Canada 2167, 150 years uh, from now. And I want to leave ample space uh, at the end to have a conversation because at the end of the day, um, uh, you are educators and, and you have inherited uh, quite a mess. You have inherited this thing we call reconciliation and there's no handbook or YouTube video series or, or reconciliation for dummies, though that is a hell of an idea <laughs> and someone smarter than me should write it because um, that would be helpful. Um, instead, every day, uh, our actions, uh, where we put our bodies, where we show up for each other, and what we actually do in the spirit and intent of what reconciliation is uh, becomes what it is defined as. And it evolves and changes, and as it should, uh, through time. And I liken it to, uh, for those of us that were born and raised uh, around, adjacent to, sort of, kind of, uh, to the res, uh, I liken reconciliation to a bag of puppies. Um, and if you're from the res, you'll know what that is. It's literally a bag of puppies that sometimes 
there's lots of puppies around and you just like Fuck, I don't want these puppies and you just go drop off a bag of puppies at someone you hate in their house you just go ah fuck this guy and you give him a bag of puppies and then they have to deal with the bag of puppies they're like who the hell dropped off these puppies and that's what reconciliation feels like to me is uh, someone dropped off a bag of puppies and now we have to deal with the goddamn puppies and it should feel like that if you're trying it, it really should it should be angering it should be frustrating uh, it should be motivating it should provide um, it should provide generative opportunities for you to be um, in, engaged in this work it, it should be it should be challenging um, it should unsettle uh, the settler uh, that's probably the last time I'll use the word settler because I don't want to fight my way out of here. People hate that word. We, it's not our word. You called yourselves that when you came. So I don't know. Uh, I'm going to tell jokes. Don't be nervous. I feel nervousness. Uh, don't, uh, you can laugh. It's not racist to laugh at a native comedian. Um, we're going to have a good time. I, I'm, I don't want to be serious all night. Uh, and I, I hope to leave you uh, with something. Um, I'm going to share a, uh, the song that was sung in my territory uh, when people came into our territory to trade um, and to make relations. And this is a song that uh, is not often sung, uh, but it is, is a song that was uh, given to me in Whitefish Bay by Chuck Kelly, who is a song maker for the Whitefish Bay singers. And it's a song that, that he's given to a few of us to sing uh, when appropriate. And I sing it tonight because what we're talking about is relationships. We're talking about a fundamental relationship to the future of this country. And this is a song that was sung at the time of treaty. <clears throat> that song uh, say thank you uh, for helping the people and in that song when it was sung uh, we sang it for people that came into our territory people that we believed were, were there to help us 
Uh, people that we understood uh, were there to help us. People that we agreed to share space with, to share land, waterways with. People that we were willing to enter into a relationship with forever. Those famous words of as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, the river flows. Those are great words. Uh, in the era of climate change, uh, fingers crossed, <laughs> hopefully the sun shines for a while longer. And fuck, the grass is barely growing. And the water is not really flowing. So I don't know where we're at with that. But it was a promise. And in entering into treaty, we weren't, there's no um, acquaintance category for us. Uh, we are not acquaintances. We, we become family when we, when we treat with each other. Mawandopanes, Chief Mawandopanes in Treaty 3 upon uh, negotiation, in fact, was, was explicit in saying, I will give you one of my children and you will give me one of yours. So we became family. The problem is, the day after the treaties were signed, uh, not literally, figuratively. Uh, we were thrown onto reserves, into residential schools. The Indian Act became law and legislation, and we know how the rest is played out. And so a fundamental question that I often pose to elders when I want to really be an asshole is, are treaties even worth the paper they're written on? Because only one side has ever benefited from the treaty. Uh, the treaty did not give indigenous people a set of rights. Treaty did not give us uh, a, a, a set of, of uh, um, privileges over Canadians. Uh, our rights are inherent uh, to our lives and fundamental to our existence. Where the, in fact, I argue there is no such thing as rights. This constitution, uh, British common law, no, the, 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 the human rights code or act, uh, the, the Canadian charter doesn't give us rights. I, I understand the legality of it. That's above my pay grade. I don't, I don't want to get into that. What I'm saying is that treaty didn't give us anything. Treaty further affirmed our place inside of our homelands. And in fact, I argue treaty gave Canadians their rights here. Treaty provided everything for this country. It still provides everything for this country because it's an illegal, illegal obligation that is agreed upon through international law that is upheld uh, and affirmed through our constitution, the thing that makes us a country. And it's something that you could never walk away from as a country because it invalidates the legal system in doing so. So we're stuck with this bag of puppies. We're stuck in this relationship and it needs to be fixed. And we become the stories we tell ourselves. And so if we continue to tell ourselves that Canada is this great utopia and melt melting pot of whatever we say this place is, not very good at calling it what it is, um, we believe we will become that, right? Um, but when the, when the relationship is so skewed and, and marred with this dark past, present, and probably future if we don't fix it, um, we have to really pump the brakes and slow down. We have to really investigate the stories we tell ourselves about this place so that we can become the country we hope, the country we dream, the country that was imagined by the people that helped uh, enter into treaty uh, here. I, I could have called this, um, that's my face. <laughs> I'm pointing this somewhere. I could have called, I've, I'm not good at titles. So I've, at, this, at first was called, we're still here. And I was gonna take a selfie and be a real stoic. <laughs> but I don't have braids and cheekbones, so it doesn't, it's not the same effect. <laughs> I could put on a wig and do some makeup, but it's not, wouldn't, it's not a good look. Uh, could have called it Disney Downey Disaster. Uh, and we're gonna talk about this uh, in a little bit. Uh, that was a title I, I had for a little while. And I, I wanted to sort of, I didn't want to start that way. I needed to reframe it. Uh, and so this is, could be another good one. Don't be scared, Canada. It's your truth too, um, because we're gonna talk about things that we don't like to talk about uh, tonight. Um, but settled on, ultimately, uh, we become the stories uh, we tell ourselves. 
there's a fundamental shift uh, happening uh, in this country. It's, 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 I think, something that we are going to uh, write books about 30 or 40 years from now. I think we're going to look back at this time, the time that we're in right now, and go, that's perhaps when it started. That's when everything started to change. And I want to be mindful of, of a couple things before we really enter into uh, the talk this evening. And it's a statement of facts for me, if we can, around how we got to this, this, this place or this era that we're calling reconciliation. Like it's, it's now an industry, in case you don't know, <laughs> there's consultants flying all around Canada creating this industry. Um, it's, it's in all sectors, private, uh, in, in nonprofit, it's, it's everywhere, it's in education. Um, and and it's we're making it up as we go and that's that's okay as I said in the in the opening but we have to be very careful about uh, who we're doing this work for and what we're doing it for um, residential school survivors themselves gave us the TRC and we should never forget that that's where I, that's that's where we need to start from don't ever be tricked into believing that it was one government or another. Uh, it doesn't matter which color the Prime Minister's underwear is. Uh, it doesn't really matter who you vote for. Residential school survivors themselves um, asked for the TRC and created it and paid for it with their own money out of the civil suit they won against the federal government. Okay? So the, the, the TRC was created through their civil suit and the money that was awarded to them. And so at the end of the day, after all they had gone through as survivors of the residential school system, they still wanted to give something good to Canada. After everything they had been through, they still wanted to do something good for this country. So if you are in this room and you are rejecting reconciliation, it's pretty gross. If you are in this room and you, 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 you say there's, no, there's not a racism problem in Canada, it's pretty gross. If you're in this room and you reject that colonialism is still alive and well in this country, it's pretty gross. There are so many ways we can point to these things. And specifically, I'll invite you to download for free Put it on your phone, your iPad, print it out at work. Don't let your boss know. It's about 300 pages. <laughs> the executive summary of the TRC. That is as close to a statement of facts as we may find in this country. Something, some, some sort of source document that we can work outward from. And if you use the, the executive summary of the TRC, it will give you a full picture of, of Canada's past and present. How we are... Uh, represented disproportionate, disproportionately so in statistics and the data that we see, you'll understand why. Because unless you're smarter than Murray St. Clair and you've written your own paper, um, I just invite you to start there. It's very good. Um, once you start there and you understand that residential school survivors themselves gave us the TRC, uh, we have to recognize that for seven years, survivors themselves traveled around this country um, sharing their story to, to be on the record, to, to tell Canada and the world, uh, you know, what happened. And, and as they sat and told their stories, they, they, some of them feel uh, as though they re-victimized themselves through the process. Some of them feel exploited, uh, exposed. It, it, it opens up old wounds. It, it, it becomes a violent process in communities. And our communities and anyone from an indigenous community can, can affirm, um, this was painful. This is painful. And so we, we're in this idea right now, and I hear the discourse around reconciliation kind of unfolding in this way that we're in this post-TRC era now, that we are actively reconciling. And I can, t I can assure you from an indigenous perspective or from an indigenous community perspective, we are in fact not that uh, these survivors that, that gave so much of themselves through the TRC process um, are healing. And there are some miracles out there. There are some elders that you have met or will meet that have healed, that are on that journey and are helping other, heals, uh, other people heal. It's a miracle. It is a miracle to see um, some of our survivors living in that, that, that healthy way. Um, 
But generally speaking, we have a long way to go. And in fact, an elder one time told me that the TRC probably was misnamed. She said, if we would have named it something a little bit differently, this might have been more effective. And she said it possibly or probably should have been named the Truth, Healing, and Reconciliation process. Because leaving out the healing and leaving a bunch of people um, torn up and in a bad way uh, is probably not helpful. And so we're still in a process of trying to negotiate um, the seven years of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, having come out the other end of it, to try to pick up those pieces and, and focus on it. Yet, we're told reconciliation needs to move ahead. This country is moving forward. Our own national chief is talking about uh, the, 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 the process of moving forward and how bu business and being players in the economy, and we're being sold this, this bullshit. And, and I, I, we, we can't move forward until we bring everyone with us. We can't leave anyone behind. And we know the data and the statistics tell us we're leaving a lot of people behind. We have a lot of work to do. So while we come to reconciliation with our good hearts and our good minds, and I appreciate each and every one of you for doing that, if you are, we have to really understand the scope. We have to under understand the, 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 the magnitude of the project. Which becomes frustrating because you're going, well, I, but, but I want to do something. This is why I'm a teacher, I, or this is, this is why I'm working in this sector, or doing this, or doing that. I, I, I want to do something. I'm here to do something. Yes, but we need you, your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, your racist Uncle Larry. We need them all. We need everybody. <laughs> Everyone's got an Uncle Larry. <laughs> we need everyone. We need all hands on deck. And we need to call all the strong hearts to the front. All the strong hearts to the front. Come to the front of the line. Lead. Show us. Let's do something together. And when your heart isn't feeling strong, when you don't feel strong anymore, fall to the back. Stay in line. Fall to the back. And let someone else lead. Let other ideas generate and see what we can build together. Now, I call this Canada 2167 because I want to look ahead to the next 150 years. I, I, I used to argue uh, publicly uh, after Murray St. Clair said, this will probably take seven generations. That's not his voice, but whatever. It, anyway, <laughs> probably take seven generations. And I was like, bullshit. We don't have seven generations. We have to do it now. I thought I was smart, eh? We have to do it now. It's going to happen in two, maybe one, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> but it's clear this is a project for the long term. It, it's, this is, it's clear that this is going to take time and it's going to take more energy than we could ever imagine. I think that if and when we start working on the project, we have to be very mindful of which voices and who, whose voices we center. And there's a few voices that we get really comfortable with. Voices that, you know, we align with politically or socially. Voices that make us feel comfortable, make us feel like we're doing the right things. And I can tell you uh, this, this is best. Reconciliation is best served when it's very uncomfortable. If you're uncomfortable, you're in the right spot. If you feel like there's birds flying around your head and you're in a Disney cartoon, get the hell out. You're in the wrong room. It's not your fault, but you're in the wrong room. Um, we have to be very careful about the stories we tell ourselves and how we start to rebuild the story of Canada. Because it's so easy to ignore the indigenous side of this history. In fact, we've done a very good job of it over the last 150 years. We've not considered indigenous perspectives on treaty and otherwise. If you read Treaty 3 today, the Queen's version, the, the affirmed version of Treaty 3, that is a set of notes, negotiation notes, from the second time treaty commissioners came through our territory. That's what reached assent. That's not even the real notes. In fact, we have our own set of notes called the Paypalm Treaty. And our own set of notes are notes that we paid um, Joseph Nolan and a couple of other Métis people that were our allies 
to take for us while we were there. And we look at those PayPal treaty notes, and you can Google this, you can see it for yourself. Our understanding of what we we're getting ourselves into is very different than the Queen's. And I think that's pretty unanimous around, uh, amongst uh, treaty nations is that they had a far different idea of what they were getting themselves into than what the actual deal uh, was. And so in the work that we do, we have to ensure that we are looking at the right stories, that we're listening to the right stories. The song I sung to you, I can, t I can I, if we had time, we would sit here and I could tell you about why that song was conducted, how it was conducted through fasting and what that means, what your obligation to that song is when it is gifted to you through fasting and through ceremony. We don't have that kind of time, but I'm, I'm telling you that there is uh, our understanding of our lives here in Canada as, as Indigenous peoples, or more specifically for me as an Anishinaabe person, it comes from somewhere. It's not made up. There are stories everywhere, all around us. Everywhere we look, there are Indigenous stories. Am I pointing this in the right? Which, which? Hey. Sorry. I had to break the tongue. Hey, you guys are still here. There are stories uh, everywhere we look that uh, sometimes we take for granted. These are nice, right? You go to Coast Salish territory. Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's so beautiful. <laughs> you can go to Northwestern Ontario and see some of the worst totem poles ever carved with a chainsaw. Uh, why? Can you ask your ancestors to stop carving totem poles and putting them up in small towns across Ontario and Manitoba? Not funny. Okay, all right. That's fine. That's fine. I thought I'd ask. Apparently you're resisting that idea. That's fine. But there are stories everywhere. Everywhere we look, there are, there are stories. There, there are indigenous histories that we can and should consider. Um, but we get, we get really good at, it, at ignoring them because some of those stories are, are too painful. Some of those stories mess with our ideas of what it means to be Canadian. I say it, uh, it upsets the settler myth. If you travel around to small towns across Canada, look on the side of the banks. Just start doing it as a practice when you travel. Look on the side of buildings and banks. This is the, the murals that are painted, telling the, the, the settlement story of that place. Never see indigenous people in those paintings. And if you have, those paintings were probably done last year. So we have to really start to unpack, well, what is it that prevented us from, from, from accessing these histories, these stories, this, this, this knowledge? Well, what, what was it? I spend a lot of time doing projects and writing for TV and everything else. And during Canada 150, I was given the chance to create a six-part mini-series for CBC Day 6 on, on, on the radio. And they uh, accepted a proposal that I gave them uh, called the 12-step program for Canada. Uh, my premise was Canada is addicted to colonialism and it doesn't even know it, and I wanted to do this series. And they said, sure, but you can't say uh, colonialism. <laughs> it's like, so, well, well, then why'd you say yes? Uh, it's about colonialism. And now these are high level producers inside the CBC that, that green light things and let you uh, do projects and pay, they pay for them. But convincing them that colonization a thing is, is even a thing um, is, is a big task. And it's, you know, you go to a number of meetings to convince them that, uh, that it's real. And then I had to bring in a picture of the colonization road in my hometown to go, fucking see, look. <laughs> that's not Photoshop, that's, I fucking, I made a movie about it. Like that's how, I, it was fact checked by lawyers so we could legally say the things we had to say. You, you still need me to talk, uh, prove that colonialism is real, okay. Great. I have six episodes to do this, by the way, and they cut one, so I only got five in the end. That's another story. I spent three episodes of five in a mini-series defending my stance that colonization is real in Canada. That the ongoing colonial project is alive and well, and it is the foot on our throats in this country. Now, in naming it, 
what it allows us to do is not blame you. Because what ends up happening when we talk about history in Canada and we talk about colonization, people get defensive. People get, they, they, they just clench their butt cheeks and they're like, I'm, one more time, he says racism, one more time, I'm leaving. It's too hard. My, I'm so, it's like, it's too much to realize that there is a dark history here that continues to this day and it is represented through the data and the analytics and, 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 and all of the statistics we know to be true about the National Inquiry, the, the disproportionate representation of Indigenous people in prisons and health outcomes and all different ways that we know colonization is still in our backyards. Yet we, we sit around and we tinker around the edges and we're too afraid to name it. But if we name it and just zoom out just a little bit, zoom out just a little bit, it allows you to see everything more clearly. We have to put this, this history into context. And your job, unfortunately, as educators, is to help young people do that. You need a framework, you need a place to work from. And if you can't name colonialism as the, as the Canadian project over the last 150 years, you're going to feel stuck, you're going to feel frustrated. Um, but there's a few very simple truths. That there is a beautiful vision for this country. There is an, a profound depth of thought inside of the two-row wampum. This Gus Swinta replica belt was given to me in 2000 by a belt maker on Six Nations by the name of Jamie Maracle. And at the time, I had no idea what it was. He's just like, I think you're going to need that. Now, because I am not Haudenosaunee and I've not been given the rights to really speak at depth and at length about this belt, I will share with you what has been what, what rights I have been given to talk about it. That is to say that this original in spirit and intent of sharing this place is probably the best answer to our problems today. If we found a way back to this, nation to nation, with our paths never crossing beside each other forever. Canada, we don't need new ideas. We don't need political scientists writing papers, generating new outcomes and, and looking at uh, the economic bene impact benefit sharing agreements. We don't, we don't need it. We have it. We have it. This, this is the founding document of Canada. We have it. And there's no confusion about what it, what it was meant to be. This was made with indigenous hands. This was given to settlers when they came here. This was the promise. This is a beautiful vision. But we get hung up in, well, indigenous people need to rock the vote. And if you rock the vote, and vote for Justin Trudeau, I voted for Trudeau. Oh, fuck. I was, oh. I was tricked. Well, it was Stephen Harper, right? So it was like, you gotta rock. I'd never voted in a federal election. Uh, I'm a staunch Anishinaabe nationalist that loves Canada. I love this country. But I am Anishinaabe. We have a governance system. I, have, I'm, I'm, I am Bear Clan Makwan Dodem. I have a set of instructions. I have a very specific way that I help my people. Jobs, responsibilities. That's, that's who I am. I love this country but I got tricked <laughs> and I voted for Trudeau. <laughs> he has good hair, good socks <laughs> and he talks a good game and it's not too late. We'll see. But it, it, this, the, the pressure on indigenous people to join the body politic and to, to make the, be the change, Obama, remember that? Be the change you want to see. And then you're like, okay, and then nothing fucking changes. <laughs> you're like, well, I thought that was a good, okay, we'll just stay patient, keep smiling, everything's fine. <laughs> it's good, we're good. <laughs> so we're, 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 so we're here, and, 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 and we're stuck. 
and, and we think that if we, uh, if Carolyn Bennett collects more beaded uh, vests, and uh, if Carolyn Bennett rocks a few more uh, indigenous printed scarves, that, uh, oh, Carolyn, they're just the beaded reckons. My mom, my mom, a survivor herself, doesn't have a beaded jacket. And Carolyn Bennett's on Twitter and selfie. Oh, my reconciliation jacket. Like, take it off. <laughs> That'll fit my mom nicely. <laughs> so we're tricked if we're told if we believe that this country doesn't have a way out of this mess. It, it certainly does. But we need to believe it. We need to believe in it. We need to see the value of indigenous liberation. And we need to see what it actually provides you, what it offers you. When the first settlers came here, they spoke multiple languages. They had to or they would have died. They'd have been killed. But they came here and they spoke our languages. And they, they, they governed themselves accordingly. And at the end of the day, uh, it was not uncommon for uh, 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 an explorer, a voyageur, whatever you want to call them, to speak multiple languages. Yet, there are two official languages in Canada today. And when you talk about the Official Languages Act, they, well, they're the two founding languages, that's the language that, it, that is used, the two founding languages of Canada. Hmm. So there weren't indigenous languages upon Confederation? the hell is that about? And now, because of the damage of residential school, we're begging for scraps to fund language tables so we can put tea and coffee and maybe some bannock on the table while people gather to relearn that language. And Canada doesn't give a shit. Canadians don't give a shit. So we have the scope, and I'm, I'm trying to be gentle but to be very firm. The scope of this is, is enormous. But there are some very specific things that we really have to get good at naming if we're going to solve any of this, if we're going to create a path, for, path towards 2167. For me, we have to ask ourselves what is good? What, 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 what inside of treaty is worth saving? Now, this bronze medal is the Treaty 3 replica medal that was given to me in 2001 by the elders of Treaty 3 at Nigakusa Naminakani. And it was given to me after I sat through four days of our treaty stories and our history. This medal, silver medal, is, uh, is uh, a piece of art created by uh, a Blackfoot artist, Justin Lewis, who runs uh, Section 35 clothing company, and that medal is called the Glitch in the Treaty. And what I want to try to think about, and I think the question for, for all of you as you start to learn more about treaty and unpack it, is, is what it means to be a treaty person. I see those posters in schools, I rip them down. It's infuriating to me. Because while it's safe to say, well, we're all treaty people. Well, okay, yeah, we live in Canada, you're Canadian, I guess. But tell me what that means. Tell me what it means. For some of you, for some of your families, for squatting where your summer house is, squatting on indigenous territory, what does that mean to you? To be a, does that what a treaty, oh, we're all treaty people, is that what that means? What does it mean to, to, to be from perhaps a city like Toronto or Edmonton or Vancouver that has displaced indigenous people? What does that mean? How do we, how do we write that? How do we make it better? We can't just say we are all treaty people because the truth is indigenous people carry the burden of treaty every single day and non-indigenous people carry the benefit of treaty every single day. Now, got a little serious, I'll go back to jokes in a minute. But we really have to be clear on this. That every time I leave the house, I'm reminded of what we're lost. Every time. Every time I see a skyscraper, we're reminded of what we've lost. I don't think most Canadians think that way. And so, 
this, this country um, is a great benefactor of treaty. And the deal is, you will be great benefactors of treaty forever. At the height of Idle No More in 2013, after um, an Anishinaabe woman was hit with a truck in Fort Francis, in my hometown, during an Idle No More protest, an emergency meeting was called for a roundhouse in Nigakusa, Nominikaning. And why we went to that meeting was we were figuring out how we were going to respond. This was a young uh, mother of three that was hit by a truck during an Idle No More protest. And we went to the roundhouse and, and my, I, I, I was helping direct the youth conversation and facilitate. And what come out of the conversation was basically, fuck it, burn it down. That this is it. This is the line in the sand. That you are not gonna run us over, literally, anymore that we aren't going to uh, wait for Chief Spence to die in a teepee on Victoria Island in the shadows of Parliament. It's game on. And we're going to shut down the Trans-Canada Highway and we're going to shut down the rail lines and we're going to bring this economy to a halt because I think truthfully that's the only way you'll get Canada's attention is you hit this country in a pocketbook and it'll panic. And make no mistake, this isn't a threat, this is the truth, indigenous people have that power in spades to shut this place down. We don't. Why? Because when we raised pipes with your ancestors that came here, we promised we would never do that. When we entered into treaty, there has never been a moment where we have took up arms to fight you. Now we have, there is a long standing resistance across these lands. There's resistance today with the tiny house warriors. There's long standing resistance in Ganawage and in many other uh, territories across this country. But it is never blown up, even in the face of Oka, when those rocks were thrown at indigenous women and children if you've not seen the movie Rocks at Whiskey Trench, watch it. When rocks and cement were being thrown at those people, they still didn't take up arms because we promised to live in peace. Now that's a heavy, heavy, heavy thing. But that's the truth. Because what we proposed inside of the roundhouse in ceremony in front of these elders' bundles, and I, I, I don't know how to explain how serious this is, that we made this proposal, but in front of all of their sacred items, in front of the sacred fire, in spite of all of the prayers and everything that had been rendered, we still said, that's enough. And we got in a lot of shit from our elders. We got in a lot of shit. The first thing... One Anishinaabe woman, Nancy Jones, said to us was, how dare you talk like that? How dare you? And we, of course, thought we were being really smart and talking well, and we were using the word decolonize. <laughs> and we thought we were right. And she said, how dare you talk like that? We made a promise to these people. And unless you know more than the pipes that were raised at the signing of treaty, you should sit down and rethink this. And we were forced to. Because I don't think there is any young person in that room that could say, yeah, no, I know more than those, those elders, those chiefs, those ancestors that signed treaty. None of us felt that way. So we were forced to reevaluate our position. Of course, cooler heads prevail. I argue we blew, I don't know more, but that's probably another talk for a different time. But it is to say that because of the promise, there's, there's, no, there's no violent way out of this relationship. There's only a path way forward. That is, in, in spite of everything that is happening, if, if 5,000, over 5,000 missing or murdered indigenous women doesn't force us to close this country down, and make this country do something different. Now, I don't know what is. We've made a promise. And I want you to understand this if you are non-indigenous. 
That promise is something that indigenous people live with every day. We live treaty. The spirit and intent of what that is is in our bodies and it's in your body too. It is. If you identify as Canadian, if you have a, a bad tattoo from high school with a maple leaf and a goose or some dumb shit, then you know, if you're proud of being Canadian, then what does that mean? What does that mean? The promise has been made, but the promise needs to be kept, right? We have to identify what it means to, to live under this agreement. Like what, what, what the hell does this even mean? To, to, to have you know, a certain set of rights as an indigenous person, rights as an indigenous person under treaty. Once in a while I get to use my status card for purchases. That's pretty cool. I pay taxes out of my ass. Ask my accountant, I can produce the documents. Most of us do unless you live on the reserve. If you leave the reserve, you lose your tax exempt status. It's a genocide policy. Stay here, good Indians. You can, you can, you can benefit from your rights if you stay here. But the second you leave, you lose those rights. I can't hunt and fish anywhere else other than this little enclosed space that we call a reserve. We weren't given rights. Indigenous rights, if we're gonna use that word, are inherent. We're in our homeland. We are home. We have nowhere else to go. There's nowhere for us to go. So that creates a set of responsibilities for those other people living under treaty. What is your responsibility as a treaty person? And we're kind of stuck here. We've been here for about eight minutes and you're like, I get it. But I just want to ask again, if there's one question you take away from this, what is your responsibility? as a treaty person. Now, we're all gonna have different ideas and I look forward to the Q&A and some of you wanna fight and some of you are like, I don't get it. And some of you have ideas, I can't wait to hear from you. But this is a big question. If we um, are going to create uh, a pathway forward, I think we're, we, we've made some mistakes in our efforts and that's, that's kind of putting it lightly. This is an old Orwell quote. Um, that you can read, he who controls the past controls the future, and he who controls the peasant, present controls the past. In the context of the stories that we tell ourselves, I like this, um, because for me this is, this is about decolonization. This is about whose stories we are centering. If we allow the he to control our past, they too will control our future. So if we allow the state, if we allow Canada, the colonial project, to control the narrative of the past, then too they will control our future. I've rewritten this because I, I, I don't think that's... They, we can be gender inclusive, we can be a little bit more fluid with that. It's not about us all the time, gentlemen. They who control the past control the future. They who control the present controls the past. And I've added the line, they who control the future understand their past and are present. And so for me, if there is a future in this country, and I think there is, we have to do a better job of really coming to grips with this past, understanding it, finding the statement of facts that, that, that you can sit with and understand and wrestle with and, and battle with and then come to grips with, um, to create the future that, that we want this country to have. But if you don't do that work, uh, you're going to miss the bus. Because this is what the TRC has asked us to do. The 94 calls to action are directed at Canadian society. They're not directed at indigenous people. They're directed at this country. In all industries. In all spaces and places. I talk with engineering students who are like, well this is bullshit. I, I'm going to build buildings. I don't need this. I'm building buildings. Yeah, how's this helpful? I'm building buildings. I'm a builder of buildings. You're building on native land, bro. You figure out what that means. How does that help your building of buildings? 
how can your buildings be better buildings? I'm going to stop this because it's too fun. <laughs> it's just a game I've caught on so far. <laughs> Medical students, teachers, law students. I mean, this is, it's, it's everywhere. This is the new status quo. This is what, this is what our future is. It's the, the bag of puppies that we can't ignore on our doorstep. It, it is the new reality. And it's not fair. It's not fair. It is a burden. But it's one that we can't ignore. Because if you are a doctor, we are disproportionately represented in health and wellness outcomes. You are going to work with our people for your entire career. You need to understand this. Would you be a better doctor if you understood this stuff? I think so. Educators, make a list we can go through and we can justify why this is important to learn, why it's important to, to wrestle with. But in, in there's a, a really easy way to do this work. It's to center indigenous voices. For 150 years, this country has told its story to the world, to itself, and, and it's an incomplete story. It's an incomplete story. We all have heard someone probably say, well, my, my ancestors, my great-great-grandpa moved to Saskatchewan and he dug out his farmer's field with his bare hands. They moved here with nothing. Uh-huh. Good. Great. D does he know whose backyard he was digging in? There's another side to the story, always. I'm not trying to disrespect your gut, really tense. You feel, you feel it though, right? I'm not the only one, you feel it too. <laughs> that we need to have, we have to be sure that indigenous people are in the room when we're, when we're doing this work. Otherwise, we're just recolonizing this history. We're recolonizing these stories. We're going as far as we're comfortable with. And that's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. And in fact, I do a lot of this type of work now. I don't know why. I used to be a comedian. <laughs> but when I go to things like this, absent, almost always, residential school survivors themselves. Absent, almost always, elders. Right? So the spaces we make are very, very important. And we have to ensure that we do a good, thorough job of understanding who can or should be in that room, right? And for me, it's clear that those that have bared the brunt of the violence, and I know it's ridiculous, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a straight, white-passing, native man standing up here, so for me to say this, I understand it's problematic. But I encourage you to center these voices specifically. Indigenous women and two-spirit people have disproportionately bared the brunt of the violence in this country. And so if we want to do better as a country, we need to hear and we need to understand these voices. They cannot be absent. These are the voices that will tell us what to do. <laughs> Very clearly, they will tell us what to do. And these are the voices we need to hear from. Because these voices are the ones that are still bearing the brunt of violence in this country, that are still overrepresented in all of the marginal data and statistics and all of these outcomes. It's, it's, this is still the truth. We're still under the foot of colonialism. And until we get better at centering these voices, we run the risk of, of doing a little bit of work but not going far enough. And this is going to be uncomfortable. They're going to kick your ass. <laughs> and you're going to sit, let's just uh, suppose that there's a uh, hundred opportunities for you to sit in front of a hundred different people. You are going to get a full spectrum of experiences and, and ideas and, and, and stories. And we should con consider them all. But this is, if, if there's a takeaway, please take a photo of this slide, put it under your pillow, uh, do what you need to do. But this is an important one for me. And it's not like indigenous people haven't been telling their stories for a long, long time. We're in this moment now where it's like, yeah, I like a tribe called Red. Yeah, went to their show, bought the shirt. I'm decolonizing my musical choices. 
<laughs> now, I've, I've, we all go through that obnoxious stage of wokeness where it's like, you know, okay, I won't go there. But uh, you know what I'm talking about. There's, a, there's an obnoxious, right? Yes. Obnoxious stage of woke where everything's your Rice Krispies in the morning were woke. It was, I had almond milk. It, I have woke breakfast cereal. <laughs> Except almond milk takes more water to make. Anyway, um, <laughs> as I drink out of a plastic bottle, who am I? Who am I? Really? Um, but, but indigenous people have been telling, have been telling stories for, for the last couple hundred years. And so I want to be clear that this moment that we're in with uh, all of the incredible fiction and, and spoken word and, 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 and music and art and film is, is, is not an indigenous renaissance. Because that would imply that it went away, that something was dead and then it came back. And that's not true. Indigenous people have been telling stories for the last couple hundred years. They, they are still telling stories, probably will never top, stop telling stories. And there are names that everyone needs to get really comfortable with. There are names that have been around for 40 or 50 years. These are the names that we should be celebrating. These are the names that we can learn from. These are the people that have already been saying everything I've said. These are some of my greatest teachers. And so if we keep looking at all of those that have, have come before us, you'll be able to get a better grasp of Canadian history than you could have ever imagined. You can do it through music. You can do it through fiction. You can do it through nonfiction. There's, there's so much material. There's no excuse now. Back in my day, I'm 40, I can say that. Back in my day, there were encyclopedias. <laughs> Half of you in this room don't even know what the fuck that is. <laughs> You're like, I got a Wikipedia. Uh-huh, I know. And we'd have to go to the library and hope someone didn't steal the letter D in order to see if I could do my fucking English project, you know? <laughs> you have the internet. You have Google. There is more material than there has ever been. So there's no excuse now to not center indigenous voices. They are everywhere. There's even a little row at chapters. It's kind of sad, but I move those books out of there and I put them right at the front. Heather's picks, fucking right there. <laughs> do it. <laughs> That's reconciliation. Everyone do it. Everyone do it. <laughs> If you get arrested, do not email me. Do not. <laughs> like, hey, can you come and bail me out of jail in Regina? There are great community sources of stories as well. There are indigenous news and newspapers and newsletters. I mean, some of the greatest source material you could ever find that connect you right to the ground, right into the community. At the time of, of, of great uprising and great celebration, uh, troubled times, celebratory times, all kinds of materials that, that you can discover uh, should you do that little bit of work. There's absolutely no excuse. So we're in this time of reconciliation and Trudeau there's I don't know if you heard it's a joke it's a dad joke but uh, just give me 30 seconds Justin Trudeau is building a new suburb outside of Ottawa it's called reconciliationville population you and me that was the joke thank you I am brilliant um, We have this idea that we're doing uh, the work. Uh, that if Carolyn Bennett is wearing her reconciliation jacket um, and we hear bits and pieces of the news talking about this rights framework that uh, is being shoved down our throats um, and that, that, that politically things are, are looking up, um, we're being sold that, that reconciliation is, is underway. 
but we're not um, we're not getting it right yet because we're still only comfortable with a certain voice or a certain number of voices and and I, I would I would predict uh, that many of us uh, privilege certain voices over others and and that's a problem these are these are some of the voices where, you know when we saw the revenant like you know DiCaprio climbing down up the mountain and he's chewed up by a bear and there's a couple of native characters and like most native people I know are like that's a that's us that's our movie <laughs> even when we're extras we're excited we're like yeah those Kevin on the back of that horse <laughs> He died in the first three minutes, but fuck, that was Kevin! <laughs> we get so excited. The, just the recognition makes, makes us excited. Moana. Whoa, Disney's decolonizing. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. No, it's not. Downey. We, I, I don't, uh, don't want to talk uh, negatively about uh, about Gord Downey because I think I think I think what he did at the end of his life is brave and good and I think that what Gord Downey did uh, in his last concert addressing the Prime Minister on national TV 30 million people watching um, telling the Prime Minister we can do better stumbling his way through it by the way but saying you know we can do better in this country is good and he creates this organization. He creates a project, creates an album, a book, uh, a movie, and, and a, a source of material to, um, to add to the, this movement called reconciliation. And that's good. That is a good thing he did. But he really, really screwed it up. Gord Downey, wrote a song about Chani Wenjack. When he heard about Chani Wenjack, who went to residential school in my territory, when he wrote that song, uh, he was inspired by the story of this, this young boy who runs away from residential school and dies. Um, had he hit the old Google machine, uh, Gord Downey would have learned that Willie Dunn, a Mi'kmaq singer-songwriter, wrote that same song in 1970. And he had the opportunity to go, oh shit, I don't need to write that song. Hey y'all, check out Willie Dunn. And in centering indigenous voices, Willie Dunn would have gotten some shine. He's the first person to have ever filmed a music video in North America with the National Film Board. There's reasons to celebrate Willie Dunn, but instead Gord Downey puts on his blinders and everyone around him puts on his blinders and, and off they go. And they get $5 million in the federal budget for indigenous education. Now, we can unpack that in a hundred different ways and I don't want to get stuck here. But I do want to say that Canadians are really good at privileging certain voices over other voices. And that's a big mistake. I'm a tragically hip fan. That was my parents' music. I grew up on it. Uh, I think, again, what Gord Downey did was good. I got to meet him twice before he passed. Um, but there's big, big problems with that project. Real problems. And they could have done that project any number of ways, but they chose to do it the way they did. And in doing that, they, they not just erase Willie Dunn, um, and many, many others. You could have a whole conversation about all of the singer-songwriters that were writing about residential school in the 60s and 70s and 80s. You could, this could have been anything. This could have been a secret path to discovering indigenous voices, but it, it's not. So it's a missed opportunity. And it's one that I think we're going to pay for for a long time. Thomas King tells us we have to be very careful about the stories we tell, because once they are told, we can't take them back. I love Thomas King for a lot of reasons, but here, what King is pointing at for me is how comfortable we get with certain voices, how comfortable we get hearing that type of voice, and how really once we find, once we find our thing, that's generally you know, where we stay.
Once we find that very privileged voice, it could be Joseph Boyden. It could be Boyden. Why was Canada so excited about that voice? Well, it was a voice that romanticized our, our lives, our existence. It was a voice disconnected and not from our existence. And therefore, the exoticism fed the settler myth. If you read the Arenda, the just the, like, you, you know he can't show up in Six Nations anymore? The Haudenosaunee are <laughs> mad at him because he didn't talk to them and he spoke for them. But it, 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 in his exotic representation of us, it's, it's disconnected and it, it's not honest. And why did Indigenous people push back so hard? Why did I personally write the article in Vice called What Color Is Your Beadwork? Is because I was asking Joseph, just tell me who you are. You're speaking for us. And what you're saying is not true. You're, you're not, you, you can't speak for us because you're not, you're, you're lying. You're not representing the people's voices. It's okay if the people push you out there and say, yes, this is what we want you to say. This is who you are. Go, you have the responsibility. But if that responsibility doesn't fall back on the speaker, that's a problem. And so when you saw the appropriation prize debacle go down a year and a half ago, when you saw the conversation around indigenous representations mattering, when you saw the cultural appropriation, or probably coming up in the next week or so, the Halloween costume conversation, representations matter. Whose voice you hear is important. And we have to be really clear that terra nullius, manifest destiny, and, and all of the, the conceptual thinking that founded Canada are directly connected to the Halloween costume question. Right? Because it is indigenous people once again fighting for our humanity. It's just through sports logos and mascots, Halloween costumes, or literally through manifest destiny. So we're still fighting. And the voices that we listen to are important. And in order for me, and we're just about done, in order for me to uh, get it right, if that's possible, we need to look back in order to look forward. That's what this word means, biscabiyong. We need to look back to look forward. And to look back, we get, we get great benefit from looking behind us and identifying the good the bad and the ugly. We get great benefit from being brave enough to name the things that went wrong in order to not replicate them. We get great benefit from sitting in uneasy moments and, and, and that uneasy feeling, but then working through it, understanding it, and coming out the other side a better person, a better teacher, a better professional, a better husband, wife, partner, a, 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 you're just, you're just better for it, for having done that work for yourself. To look back, to look forward, I think is fundamental. Storytelling allows us to remember. One time, uh, a gentleman, an academic actually from South America, came up to me and said, tell me about uh, the word remember. I was like, I don't know, what, what do you mean? He said, well, what, what does it mean to remember? So I'm like, well, dictionary, right? I'm like, well, to remember is to like to, it's the act of re recalling, re rem it's remembering something, to recall a thing that you did, <laughs> you're remembering. And he said, no, no, just look at that word and think about it. And then he walked away. You ever have that happen where you're talking to an elder and they just drop a grenade and they're like, peace, good luck. <laughs> That's what it was. And I was like, what? don't go. You can't do that. What the? F don't do that. And he just walked off. And I think about this word a lot. And this is what I'm trying to do with it. The, the, that storytelling, the stories we tell ourselves, allows us to remember our communities. Our stories will bring us back to whole. Our stories will offer a chance to bring us back into this circle 
a circle that metaphorically or literally was broken with residential school or colonization and all the bad things. But story allows us to remember. And to remember, for me, is the project right now. Indigenous storytelling, for me, will take us further faster. Because it offers you a doorway to walk through. It's not a prime minister or a chief with a war bonnet. It's a story. It's an experience. And to walk through that doorway is to experience something that is given through love, in a, in a profound act of love, I think. And it is generous. They're, they're giving you something. It's, now it's yours to take. And to remember, for me, is, is fundamental to uh, the Indigenous Liberation Project, for sure, but probably to decolonization or reconciliation, however you want to frame it. But we have to be certain of whose voices we're listening to. When you say things in Canada like, Sir John A. Macdonald was a prick, well, we know how that goes. Not very well. When you start to challenge Canadian settler identity and the heroes whose names are on the streets that we drive on or the buildings that we study in, it's, it's a problem. And as long as Indigenous people don't rock the boat, Canada generally is okay with us, right? But when we become visible, I don't know more, we become a problem. When we stand in the way, uh, we become a problem. When we use our voices, we become a problem. There's something that, that happened one time. I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this picture. This is in Fort Albany in Pitabic. This is Edwin Matatawaban in, in the bonnet here, a residential school survivor. And I was asked to go to Pitabic after a, a series of, a string of suicides. Um, in about 15 months, there were four youth uh, suicides. And uh, a team of us, six of us, were asked to go up there to create a, a youth leadership uh, cultural model that uh, could possibly help these youth um, come out of this, this really traumatic uh, time. And, uh, and so we went up there and we started to facilitate a process of just listening to youth. And you as teachers or future teachers, educators, know that's probably the best thing we can do, is listen. We tend to talk, I'm a talker, but the best thing we can do, make no mistake when you work with young people, is listen. And we sat and we listened uh, to these youth, and you can see the sticky notes. Um, that was our first, like, this is our opening exercise where we started to talk about some of the things that were bothering them. And um, by the end of our four-day process, all of, the wall, all of the walls were covered in notes and, and papers and, um, and we, we, we facilitated the process to, to understand what they were thinking. And we took it away um, and we wrote the report. And when we arrived um, on the first day, the chief said, we, we've been given some money. We have about $380,000 that has been given to us from De Beers, the diamond mine. That, that is in their backyard, and a couple of other industry uh, people that are in their territory to help um, pay for whatever comes out of this process. And so we knew that there was a budget, and then we gathered all the notes and we started to put it together. When we assembled the report, it was a very, very thin document, about 10 pages long, that essentially said that all of these young people were basically asking for time. They didn't want to go to West Edmonton Mall. They didn't want to go to a Toronto Raptors game. They wanted to do things, as you can read, teachings, workshop, listen to elders. They wanted to ha go rabbit snaring. They wanted time. They didn't want PlayStations or a youth center. They wanted time. And that's all the youth of Pitabek talked about. I want to be able to go goose hunting with my uncle. I want to be able to do this or this or this with TP teachings. I want to go out and get TP poles. I want to spend time with elders. You can read it. This, these, this is 
These are notes. And time is something that De Beers uh, couldn't buy these kids. The $380,000 budget that we had, I think we may have spent about $70,000 of it getting things like knives and guns and materials for the activities that they wanted to do. And in fact, when we handed the report back and we sat with the, the community leaders, they were pissed off at us because we didn't spend the budget. And they're like, if you don't spend it, we, they, they take it back. I was like, well, I don't buy more guns. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what to tell you. Like, cause we did our work. This is what our, these are our findings. And the youth of Pitabic knew exactly what they wanted. And, and when we talked with them, we, we, we started to connect their, their ideas of what they wanted to do with community resources, with people that were already there. People that are not famous native people like Adam Beach or, or whoever else that all of the community people, the resources, we did a community mapping process and we found that we had everyone we needed. We just had to believe that the project was worth it in the community. That the people that were already there doing that work had all the answers that were necessary. And I can't say for certain whether the work we did there or not will work in the end, but what it displayed and what it showed was that this community knew exactly what it needed. It had the answers all along. Just needed to be shown or reminded. They needed to remember. The last, um, the last to, to connect this back to treaty, I hope. I, don't, I, don't, I think I've done a shit job of talking about treaty, but this, you get what you get. Um, <laughs> I can't do it over. We don't have time. See, she's leaving. She's like, yeah, you're right. I'm out. <laughs> Um, this, is, this comes from Treaty 3, Manituaki and Akanagewan. This is a conceptual framework that the elders in Treaty 3 came up with in, through the early 90s to work with uh, resource companies that were coming into Treaty 3. Um, we live in a rich mineral belt. Um, uh, we live in, in, in a territory 50, 55,000 square miles of Treaty 3 that um, each and every town uh, inside of our treaty territory was founded on pulp and paper. Uh, whacking down trees and cutting them up and sending them wherever they send them. And uh, for a long time, for over a hundred years, that industry kept these small towns alive. Uh, and in the 90s, there was a shift. They knew that uh, you couldn't cut down trees forever because you eventually run out of trees. <laughs> So more and more mineral and, and mining industries were coming into our territory and the elders were in a bit of a panic because there was no real framework for us to, to conduct our business with them. And so they had to pump the brakes on all of these meetings and negotiations and say, what does it mean for us to be negotiating with, with industry in this way? And the document and, and the work they came up with is, is entitled Manituaki and Akanagewan. And these words loosely translate Manitou is spirit, Aki is land. And Inokanagewan doesn't really mean law, but it's, it's easy for the slide. Inokanagewan is, um, is a sort of a conceptual framework that talks about your relationality, your relation to all things that are, that were, and that will be. So in a way it is law, it's our law, uh, a, a universal law, a law connected to place and, and to land. And so this framework of spirit, land, and law, relationality, reciprocal relationship to the environment, to the land, the water that you depend on for life, um, was the framework and they started to kick that around over a number uh, of years. And what they basically said, uh, you can read in the book, uh, The Secret. Number two best-selling book on the planet, The Secret. White lady jacked our teaching. Just like, I'm selling it, I don't even care. It's a book now. <laughs> number two best-selling book. Number one best-selling book is Fifty Shades of Grey, but that's, again, <laughs> an another talk. <laughs> right, Eagle? <laughs> that's a different talk altogether. Tania's not here yet. Daniil will be having that talk later.
but it's basically the idea of what goes around comes around. That what you put in is what you get out. That what happens on the land happens to the people. That if you are violent to the land, the people will also experience violence. We see this with man camps around the tar sands, violence on the land, violence against women. It's inarguable, it's connected. And we can go to a political science class or sociology, I don't care where we go debate this. It's, it's pretty clear. And the elders knew this and they said, well, if we're gonna, if we're gonna work this way and we're gonna invite industry here, let's be aware that this is what's gonna happen to us too. And they did some really great thinking and some great work around it. Ended up shutting out industry in a large part um, in our home territory uh, to their great benefit. And, and to this day, we still, other than a few exceptions, we, we live in a really, really beautiful, immaculate place. Of course, there are, are, are some exceptions, Grassy Narrows and a few others in our territory that have been decimated through, <laughs> through time by industry. But generally speaking, they did a great job. And I want to offer this to you uh, as, a, as a way of saying thank you for, for being here this evening, to apply it into what you do, that what you put into this treaty work is what you will get out, that what you see as potential or what generates excitement for you uh, will reward you. It will bring you great things in your life, that what you put into the work that you are going to embark on through your career, whether it's in your, 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 your career or your, your personal life, what goes around comes around. And I know that to be true. I don't know anything else to be true. I don't know what happens when I die. I don't know if I go to heaven. I've never died, so I don't know. <laughs> we believe it takes you four days to make a journey up to the spirit world. Each day is a test and a celebration and a feast for that person at the fourth day you were greeted by your ancestors. I don't know if that's true. It's a cool, it's a nice story. But again, I've never died. But I know for sure that the land teaches us everything we need to know. What goes around comes around. Spring, summer, winter, fall. Forever in relationship. All of the medicines, the plants, the animals in that same relationship forever. Anishinaabe people inside of that relationship forever, in relationship to those seasons. That's why we moved. We weren't savages. We just followed the food, you guys. We just, oh, it's blueberry camp. Okay, let's go over there. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> it's winter. Oh, shit, let's get off the lake. It's fucking cold over here. Let's go in the bush. Okay, where's the blueberries? Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> forever in relationship in reciprocity. And what the land teaches us is how to live in reciprocity. Because when you take care of the land, it will take care of you. When you whack down the trees and poison the water and dig up the minerals, you, you, you get rid of the medicines, you chase out the animals, and the fish leave forever. But when you live in relationship to it, in good relationship to it, you benefit from it. And I apply this to almost everything I try to do, is that if you have good spirit and good intent, the universe will take care of you. It will give you what you need uh, when you need it. Miigwech, thank you very much. I was just a map I found online. Um, <laughs> I needed a slide and... So when you talk about the gray zone, does that have an implication? 
Um, well, what I'm trying to say in framing it around Canada 2167 is that if there is a future uh, in Canada that we just really need to examine it. So there's not much meaning to the slide. However, one of the things that I wrote, this artwork specifically comes from a thing I wrote for Vice, um, basically reimagining the country. Um, and what my proposal was is that if we don't have a problem with the EU, um, politically or otherwise, that, that, and we celebrate the idea of the EU, in fact, maybe some of you here after high school filled up a backpack with t-shirts and, and some money and condoms and whatever else and you <laughs> went over to catch the train and live your 18 year old life and discover yourself or the world. We've, that's an, amazing. Some of your children are, you, maybe you've done that. Um, we have no problem with that. And it, it's, the, it's the architecture and the food and the cultures and the languages. And that's an exciting idea. That's why people go there. Um, I argue that that same diversity is here for people to discover. Now you could jump on a train in Canada and experience the same things through indigenous nations. And, and my argument, that artwork came from the piece in Vice, my argument is that that shouldn't scare people. That, that, that could be a very amazing thing for a country to celebrate the, the diversity in indigenous nations across Canada. Um, well, I think, uh, I think if you haven't already, just for yourself, read the executive summary, um, I think that that is as close to, what Canada needs so there is no arguing or tinkering around the edges is a statement of facts. And I've long held that belief and there isn't one. Um, and as soon as you start to try to build one, of course there's contention on one side or the other and bias and all, everything, all kinds of things play into that, getting to that statement of fact. But what it provides us, if, if we find a, a statement of facts, and I think the executive summary is as close to one as we'll get, um, is that we have a common language to speak and we have a place to start from. Um, and I think the challenge specifically for educators is what place are we starting from? And that becomes more complicated when you look at the grades you're teaching and the materials that are available to you. They can't pr print uh, textbooks fast enough. It just can't happen fast enough. Um, that's why I, I appreciate you using the podcast and stuff from Indian and Cowboy because, and our, our company, now this isn't a pitch. Well, it's kind of, well, yeah, fuck whatever. Um, <laughs> it's sort of a pitch, but it's not. Our, my, my digital media company, McCoon's Media Group, that's, this is why we're getting into the educational space is that we've looked around. Textbooks are four, five, six, seven years away from being printed, um, but digital media can respond far quicker. And there are already iPads in the classroom, and I know some people are pro-technology in the classroom and some aren't, but we're just trying to fill that space with good things. And so where to start from in the classroom, I, that's over, I, I, you understand that better than me. But I would say always fight to have indigenous voices centered. Um, always fight to have, look at those materials and where they're coming from. The industry I'm talking about being built around reconciliation is one full of consultants, predominantly non-indigenous consultants that are writing handbooks and textbooks and producing materials very quickly. It's odd how quickly some of these things are being produced um, and I would question why and how. So, um, There's also a podcast in Red Man Laughing that's called A Statement of Facts for Canada. Oh, well, I say fuck in that one a lot. But, <laughs> but yeah, we have to start from, we ha the foundation is, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I keep saying it, and that's the best answer I can give you, is the executive summary of the TRC is a complete history. Um, there is no politics. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a neutral document that just uses factual history. Mm hmm Yes, sir. Well, that's so polite. I have to, ca I have to catch a plane. Hurry up. 
Yeah. Um, so, with the most recent um, Supreme Court um, decision, um, which now states that the government doesn't have to consult with regards to uh, legislation that it's making uh, with First Nations group. Um, how does that work with reconciliation? Is reconciliation really possible within the economic and colonial framework that must still exist? Because I think until we have uh, an honest discussion about whether that, that's even possible, mm -hmm. then, you know, reconciliation will remain a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. So, for me, it's, it, for me it's not. I don't yep. really know what my answer is, but yep. I want to hear your opinion on that, how we get past. I'll answer, yeah, I'll answer in two parts. Uh, first, um, uh, the glo <laughs> gloomy side of it is Canada can't afford reconciliation. It, there's no way it can afford reconciliation because um, fundamental to the colonial project is land and fundamental to undoing the harm is the return of land. And I don't think Toronto is going to be given back to the Mississaugas of New Credit anytime soon. Uh, I don't, the, the political framework that, that really needs to unfold around, around a, a pathway forward or a pathway to nationhood for indigenous people is complicated but also very simple. Uh, it, and it begins with the economic relationship because the Indian Act, the, the legislation that keeps us Indians, um, it really underpins the fiduciary responsibility of the Crown to indigenous people. And if we start to, if we do away with the Indian Act, uh, we have to replace it to ensure that the fiduciary responsibility stands. And so the, the, it's not a political question at all. There are provincial territorial organizations in Canada right now that work on behalf of indigenous people that if we were given the time and space and resource to do the work of determining indigenous nationhood ourselves, it would be easy. We know who we are. Uh, we know that these PTOs, as they're set up right now, don't represent the, 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 the truth of indigenous nationhood. But it's a, frame, it's a place for us to start. And I think we could all sit in a room and probably a week go, okay, we know that you guys actually aren't even Cree. Right? Uh, your families are mostly Lakota and you ran up here. Like, so we can do all that. We know who we are. Um, but the economic question and the fiduciary responsibility of what it means for Canada to even exist is, is, one, is an economic question alone. The, the question of law and what, what, what that means, um, I don't think it hurts reconciliation. Um, it, just, it just says that, that Parliament um, is allowed to create law as it does currently. Right? And then it's debated, and, and it's, it's a shitty system anyway. So whether the Supreme Court uh, favored the, the Miccosu Cree or not, it, it doesn't work for us anyway. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a moot point as far as I'm concerned. I haven't read it yet. It, it, I'm going to read it. Um, but the reading that I've done so far on it, it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a moot point. And it's, again, it's the minutiae that we can get caught up in. Um, if I'm being honest, and I mean no, no disrespect to the Miccosu Cree, they shouldn't have gone to that court anyway. Why are we going to your courts, Canada? Why? Why would we go to your courts to have our responsibilities affirmed? It's, it's preposterous. But those are the mechanisms that, that that's why we're stuck. Right? So it's a, it is a bit of a moot point for, for me personally. I don't know if that's helpful at all, but... Um, no, it is. I, I actually um, fully endorse and support the point that you just made as to why we even need to go within this system to try to seek justice from a system that has never provided mm. any sense of justice. Mm. So I agree with that. Miigwech, thank you. Yeah. My, my question was just very practical because I have, coming back to the stories we center um, and who we have in the room having these conversations with us too. Um, how how can sort of new teachers um, help themselves to not fall prey to that sort of industry? So I you know I've heard a story recently about that, um, which is I mean this is not surprising, but anyway, 
of a, of a sort of a fraudulent elder going in to work with teachers and in fact creating a lot more division and as the teacher who is coming from a different place, coming from British Columbia with different experiences, but I don't think this person's an elder. They're not talking like any elder I've met. And then doing some research and finding out that they're fraudulent. Um, and, and realizing that they're, as a teacher, they're sort of in a difficult position with their school board, saying the school board said, well, we did the thing. Yep. So we don't need to do that again. Yep. Uh, would you have any advice for young teachers on how to sort of navigate those, those waters as, as we all learn and then as we know that they're, they're posing really? The school boards are supposed to serve you. So if I were a teacher, I would organize. <coughs> And I would ensure that the school board that I work under, with all of my teacher friends, was serving us. And I know it's easy for me to say I'm not a teacher. I don't fear losing my job. I don't have a job. Uh, so that's cool. But, so I can talk a big game. But we have to hold those that are, created, that are recreating the system accountable to make sure that the system works for us. Um, and we might make some mistakes and we might get it wrong, but we really have to pressure those that are, are, are recreating these systems um, to account and, and, and do what we have to do to ensure our voices are heard. I want to acknowledge, because I've been in many classrooms over the last couple of years, it's a scary place to be. Uh, for some teachers that are three, four, five years into their teaching careers, all of a sudden the bag of puppies shows up, right? And it's like, holy shit. First of all, I didn't learn any of this in school. This, I'm learning as much as the kids are right now. Like, it's a difficult place to, place to be. Um, and so I, I want to acknowledge that. And, and that's why I think teachers really need to be asking for supports that way. Um, and I know provincially this is where it gets complicated. Um, some provinces are a little bit further ahead in that journey than others, but look at those best practices. I, I'll, I'll make a pitch, come to the Think Indigenous Conference in March. It's our fifth year. Uh, we kick around these ideas all the time. Um, and the Think Indigenous Conference um, has happened the last four years at the University of Saskatchewan. This year it'll be in Edmonton, Alberta, March 19th to the 22nd. And it's just a conference, a four-day conferences of best practices in Indigenous education. And we say Indigenous education, we mean education uh, from an Indigenous lens. And so the Think Indigenous Conference, we have the Think Indigenous podcast that you can listen to, to hear from teachers that are already wrestling with these things. Um, you can listen to Think Indigenous and take the best practices for yourself and leave what's not helpful. We're trying to work in that space as much as we can with our podcast company, Indian and Cowboy, um, to try to, because we know how difficult that space is so yeah thank you yeah um I, I was just gonna jump in on that too like native twitter like just just follow people and then you can pretty quickly see who are your good voices and who are ones you should be like joseph boyden was pretty much just getting used right <laughs> poor joseph <laughs> okay uh we're gonna wrap up here so um thank you so much to everyone who came out we are heading to Lancaster's for food and drinks and um, debriefing. We're not providing. We are not paying for any of that. <laughs> <laughs> we're just going, we have booked the venue and your money will- There's a place you can go if yeah. you want. <laughs> but yeah, there will be um, discussion and debriefing if you would like to join